In the name of Jesus, amen. Our story for today is really about three things, idolatry, fire, and faith. But maybe we need to back up just a little bit and remember how we got here. Last week, Elijah stood before the people of God to reveal the power and authority before them in Almighty God, King of heaven and earth. But still, after each new king and the weakness of the collective heart of God's people, a new prophet would preach repentance and forgiveness to no avail. Eventually, God sent in the greatest empire the world has ever known, who captured the great city of Jerusalem, burned down the temple and carried away all the holy vestments and worship furniture and toted away hundreds of Israelites into exile. Eventually, the Babylonian government required idolatry because of the golden box that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. What the Israelites were commanded not to do in the first commandment, their Babylonian captors required as a mandate across the countries that they ruled. Scattered throughout the Babylonian empire, however, were faithful Jews who had to find new ways of being faithful and being faithful as God's people. The concept of the synagogue, a house of worship centered on the preaching of God's Torah and prayer, was actually a development during this time period. When there was no temple and no place to worship, God's people gathered together to hear the word and be reminded of how to be God's people, even in a foreign land and in foreign rules. But now King Nebuchadnezzar had set up this golden image and required that everyone from greatest to the least bow down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Did you notice that phrase repeating itself over and over? It's a reminder in the text to us as the hearers that most idols are man-made creations that do not measure up to the holy God our Savior. I wish I could say that King Nebuchadnezzar was the last idolatrous leader or the last creator of an idol in human history, but that, as you well know, is simply not the case. While certainly this government-mandated idolatry is rather strange to our American ideals, most often we don't even really need the help of the government to create an idol for ourselves. How quick we have been to abuse the freedom of religion, to leave behind our Christian values, and even coerce the gospel to affiliating itself with our political ideology. Our culture has even developed TV shows about idolizing someone for their talent. And you'd hope that the church would be a faithful alternative to the I, this gadgets that help us build our Insta idol of me, myself, and I. But even we have managed to squeeze God into a box so that we might contain the God we've created in our own image into the smallness of our intellect. We have even idolized God's church and its leaders, all the while missing the one to whom all of this was supposed to point, our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to cave to King Nebuchadnezzar's decree, to the sound of their musical summons, or to the golden image which he had set up. In fact, when questioned by the king, they were defiant, with a courage that certainly should challenge all of us to re-examine our priorities and reassess our commitments. Do we dare call ourselves Christians when we put our occupational schedules, our workout routines, and even our family priorities before the commitments of serving the Lord fully in our lives? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not only refused to bow down to this graven image, but they placed their entire confidence in the hands of an almighty God who they expected would show up in mighty and powerful ways. 
They blindly trusted that his power would deliver them from the fiery furnace and that they must go through it to be faithful to their God and King. It is the strength of their faith that results in a fiery response. The king turns up the heat a blazing seven times higher than the normal temperature and casts them into the furnace. Too often, we buy the lie that faith is simply fire insurance (laughs) from the flames of hell, or it's a get-out-of-jail-free card by which we are cheaply pardoned for our sin. And once we've secured the remedy for eternal death, we quickly move on to what the world might call the bigger and better things. But our story today disproves such realities. Faith is not three clicks of the heel and we get home. Faith is not the happy-go-lucky life where all is sunshine and puppies and rainbows. Instead, faith sometimes leads us right into the heart of disaster the number of which are too numerous to count after the year we've had. Fellow citizens' homes have been destroyed by hurricanes, floodings, and fire. Our sisters and brothers in the faith across the globe are threatened with murder and persecuted for confessing the name of Jesus. Two weeks ago, our sisters and brothers in the faith were praying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done and it looked as if evil might win the upper hand in the sanctuary of a church in Texas. When, because of sin, your marriage is unraveling or your family dissolves into a yelling match or simple silence in resentment and bitterness toward one another. It's the unexpected loss of a job, a diagnosis, the accident, the harsh reminder that none of us are getting out of this life alive, or at least alive in the same way that we've always known. It seems that faith in the Son of God does not lead us out of trouble. It does not always protect us from the harm and hurt which is so readily available in this life. In fact, sometimes faith leads us right into the firestorms of life. It waltzes us under the crosses we are called to bear for weeks and months and years without end. So what could be our response when the going gets tough and when our prayers seem like they might not be enough? Will we have any staying power to fight for the convictions of our faith instead of our self-made desires? Is it possible that little by little, each new decision we have to make could be God-honoring? Is it possible that even though we are wrought with sin, that God in his goodness might transform our wills, our heart, our mind, and our flesh into the saints of his glorious kingdom and that we might be a reflection of the splendor of his light. This Sunday we celebrate the final festival of the church here, Christ the King Sunday. Even as we observe this festival, we acknowledge the idolatry, the fire, and the faith which we have encountered along the way. We are forced to admit to ourselves that we have had other gods who simply have not made the cut for us. We have strayed and faltered and wandered off. We confess that we have fallen into the trap of idolatry all around us. We are challenged to see where our allegiance really lies when the fire is cranked up and we can hardly bear the burden of what sin, death, and the devil might throw our way. But a different name for this Sunday is actually the festival of the reign of Christ. It is when we praise Jesus, confess the creed, and pray in his name that we are pledging allegiance to the only one who has died to save us. When we say that Jesus is Lord, we are honestly saying that I am not Lord of my life. We commend our entire selves, both in life and in death, come what may into the hands of the one who rules over every time and every place, even on to eternal life. 
The faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is certainly a powerful example to us all. It dares us to believe in the face of injustice or the trials of our own lives. Their faith is certainly admirable, but please don't let their faith trip you up either. It shouldn't cause you to wonder or worry if your faith is strong enough or bold enough. Because faith is not simply a wishing for Christ to appear. Instead, faith is the certainty, the certainty that Jesus will come and that he is already with you whether you believed it or not. Faith is learning to follow where God is leading, even into the fire, and knowing that he will be with us, and together we will come out the other side unscathed. Faith is learning to live in the certainty of your king, regardless of your status, whether you're a member of the court, a pauper who stands outside the palace, or a refugee and an an exile in a strange land. Faith is knowing that Christ is king and you are not, nor is your spouse, your child, your schedule, or anything else. And once nothing else is in his place, then Christ makes his triumphal procession into the throne of your heart forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.